Well, this, well, good good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, this is our uh, August sixth uh, chat with Green Aggies, um, and I I want you to uh, notice that we have uh, changed our uh, picture. Uh, you know the whole thing. Laura, don't go yet, and uh, still uh, don't don't just hide your face yet. Um, we want to recognize everyone on this team, so we replaced the old uh, banner uh, with this new one. So uh, with us today, we have myself, uh, Dr. Meng Mangu, I'm Associate Professor Extension Specialist from the Department of Horticulture. Uh, next on my screen is Carlos Bogram. Carlos, do you want to rave, uh, wave, wave your hand? Uh, Carlos is, this, uh, is our friend from the industry, uh, from OHP. Next on my screen is Laura Miller. Laura, wave your hand. Laura is our uh, uh, horde agent in Tarrant County. Next is Airfong. Airfong, wave your hand. Okay, all right. Um, let's see, is Becky here? Becky, I think you're here. Becky, do you want to show your um, webcam? Uh, let's see what you're eating, Becky. Yes, yes, <laughs> Becky. Let's see what you're eating. She may have gone in the waiting room and then walked off for a bit. Okay, all right. So, um, so you know, um, many of you probably uh, familiar with us that were a, a weekly discussion with a specialist. Uh, me, I'm a specialist. Airphone is a specialist. Laura is an agent. Uh, Paul is an agent. Dr. Becky uh, Ballin is also a specialist. So we're from horticulture, plant pathology, entomology, soil and crop, and industry. Carlos is our industry friend. So. Um, so we want to recognize, and, and I want to make a special mention about this new banner that, uh, that uh, Becky made. She actually went to our social media page and get, you know, a, a picture that we posted, you know, from our social media and made this banner. So uh, this is really a, a lot of effort on her part for making this new brilliant banner. By the way, she made the first one too. So uh, really a lot of thanks to Becky. Um, and you may hear some uh, background noise, uh, like a baby crying, and that's just I, the special uh, sound effect that I put on for you all. Adds ambiance. I like it. Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Feels like we're actually right there with you. <laughs> and just, uh, and just my, uh, my mic here, uh, I don't know whether you can see that. This, this thing here, it's just too good. It uh, picks up everything. But anyway, so today we have... Um, uh, roughly, we have uh, three topics. Uh, first, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about a uh, sensor-based uh, irrigation, uh, sensor-based uh, irrigation monitoring and control uh, the, the project that we're doing at two nurseries. And, uh, and then uh, Laura is going to tell us a little bit about um, a plan of the week, Basham's Party Pink. And I think... Uh, Becky has a slide too, so uh, so we'll go with that. Um, so back in the springtime, I did a webinar um, and I invited Dr. Zhang Lee Cox, a professor at Maryland, you know, discuss his experience uh, on irrigation, you know, sensor-based irrigation monitoring uh, and uh, control that saves water and, and cost, of course. So. Um, if you're interested in his presentation, you know, it was a, an hour long, uh, full blown um, uh, uh, webinar. And uh, it was, you know, if you just uh, uh, on YouTube, if you just uh, Google, not Google, on YouTube, you search uh, Spring Quick Buy webinar series and you'll find uh, this uh, sensor based irrigation monitoring and control in one of the, it's in the series, it's one of the, um, the recorded webinars. I will, if you're interested in, you know, uh, this type of information, I'll definitely invite you to, uh, you know, view that uh, webinar, view that recorded webinar. So today I'm going to tell you all a little bit about my experience uh, uh, using the sensor-based, you know, um, automated, sensor-based automated monitoring and irrigation system in, you know, to, to achieve nursery water conservation. So what is the uh, current situation? Right now, the current situation, I'm just gonna use one of the nurseries that we're uh, working with, uh, you know, just use that as an example. And this is actually relatively uh, a small nursery. You know, there are 
uh, over 13,000 13, plants, ranging from three gallons to 72-inch boxes. So the 72-inch uh, boxes, uh, an estimate, the volume is about 300 gallons. So, you know, they do have, they do have a lot of 300 gallons, 200 gallons, 100 gallons. But anyway, I'm just going to use, uh, choose a medium size, medium size, 45 gallon as a, as an example. You know, 45 size, a, 40, a 45 gallon live oak as a standard and assume, and that uh, assumption is based on a uh, publication from University of Florida, IFAS, you know, their live oak water usage. So the, the estimate water use for a 45 gallon live oak would be very close to a thousand gallon per year, very close to a uh, thousand gallon per year. So, you know, we are just use that to multiply. Again, this is an estimate, you know, this is an estimate, but very close estimate. So for the whole nursery, and the, the, again, the nursery is not uh, too big. The production area is uh, 15 acres. So we uh, end up on a total annual water use of roughly about 13 million gallons for the whole nursery. 13 million gallons for the nursery. Um, right now uh, on the farm, you know, they, they don't have, uh, they don't really have a water meter uh, since it's, the water comes from the well and, um, and, and you know, it's all uh, underground water it's not metered, uh, but you all know that we have had some really scary, severe drought in the past couple of years. And, and this irregular um, precipitation, this you know, irregular drought is only, this, is only gonna get more common you know, as, uh, as uh, climate change and, and stuff, you know, all the things going on. And you know, we, we have had, I remember, um, I remember when I was uh, hired uh, in 2012, uh, one of the, the um, presentations that I made for my interview, you know, was the drought situation, was the drought situation because back in 2011, you know, Texas had the, the record uh, drought situation and, you know, in in the last couple of years, we have seen, you know, in some of the municipalities, you know, uh, put in a water irrigation uh, restriction on uh, landscapes, on landscapes. So, uh, you know, not only in Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, so in all these, in all these places. So it all has a lot to do with the underground water, whether, you know, the precipitation, whether rainwater could replenish um, the uh, underground water. So research, um, uh, plenty of research has uh, reported about 20 to 25 percent reduced water use in nursery in, 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 in nurseries in nurseries and uh, uh, when they go on when they you know go on for uh, sensor based uh, monitoring and irrigation system so. So most of the nurseries these days, uh, what they're using is timer-based, is timer-based uh, uh, irrigation. So basically every day, um, like depending on the size of the nursery, depending on the size of the nursery, if the, if the nursery is small, maybe all sections will be watered at the same time. If the nursery is very big, you know, they may uh, water certain sections at a time. So uh, it's basically is timer based. It's, you know, water for so long uh, every day, um, you know, turn on the, the timer, turns on the uh, irrigation and turns it off. So that's how it's, it's doing. So in this timer based system, in this timer based system, what we're not factor in is how plants feel about it. Are they thirsty uh, or, you know, do they need water? So anyway, so, so I'm just going to use this 20 to 25% uh, average. So if, if we could, if we could, you know, use um, sensor-based uh, monitoring irrigation system, 
you know, at this farm, at this nursery alone, we could be saving, you know, about 3 million gallons of water per year. And, you know, this is just one of the uh, about 700 uh, wholesale nurseries and greenhouse growers, you know, with the typical sizes uh, range from 50 to 2000 acres, you know, in Texas. Again, this is uh, uh, just in, this is just in Texas. So, so this is the major reason that I was like, oh, let me, you know, let's, let's see whether we could uh, achieve this. Let's see we, whether, you know, we could achieve this, you know, in some of the nurseries in, in Texas. Okay, what I want to show you here, um, what I want to show you here is, is the sensor reading, is the sensor reading that, uh, that we're doing at one of the nurseries. So, so in this uh, setting, we have the timer based. So this is the, uh, the sensor, the, the moisture sensor reading in September uh, 2009. And this one you can see is timer based. This is uh, the lower limit of the irrigation of the moisture sensor, you know, the is eight and the upper limit is 11. So basically in this setting, the uh, irrigation water will be turned on when the uh, moisture level go below, uh, go below eight. So it's gonna turn on, on, on until the moisture sensor reads 11, it's gonna turn it off. And then a different setting is, uh, you know, at 10 to 13%. So basically, you know, at 10% at it's going to be turned on, at 13% it's going to be turned off. So, so between these two, between these two, uh, this is uh, uh, less water, this is uh, more, uh, more water, you know, because the moisture level is higher. So this is a high moisture level uh, treatment. This is a low moisture level treatment versus this one. And as you can see that, uh, it's, it's, it's basically uh, every day, it's turned on, uh, I think for about 10 minutes or something, you know, it's turned on and then, you know, and then the irrigation, the, uh, the moisture, um, the sensor, the sensor reading, you know, as plant, uh, you, as plant uh, uses water, the sensor, the moisture reading goes down and then uh, as you start water, so this is normally where it's at, at the bottom. You know, this is normally where you see it start water. And uh, as it water, as the irrigation is on, the reading goes up. When it's turned off, this is where it turns off. You know, water start to drain out. Uh, water start to drain out. Plant uses water. The reading goes down. Um, reading goes down, and then you know, again, turn on, turn off. Uh, turn on, turn off. And sometimes uh, you may have uh, like a rainwater here or there. And obviously last year we probably didn't have a whole lot of, last year we probably uh, in September at this location and this uh, looks like a, uh, a big rain event. I mean, you know, uh, it looks like a big rain event because as you can see that the moisture hasn't really go down yet, uh, you know, to those level, and then it, it went back in the, it went up, up. So, so this could be one of those rain events. And if you uh, look at this one, you know, um, you know, when there's not a whole lot of uh, rain water, so it's, it's, it's very similar to this one, it's turned on, uh, but may not, uh, you know, it's turned off, but may not as much water as it reaches here, you know. So you can see that the bar here may be uh, lower. And these, it could be that, you know, when it's needed more water, it could be turned on. So, so in this case, uh, so this is 8 to 11 percent, this is 10 to 13 percent. So this is what the um, uh, sensor reading uh, looks like for April 2020. So just um, four months ago in, in April. So this is what it looks like, the timer-based. The timer-based, um, again, it's, you know, the timer-based, it's uh, turned on for the same time uh, every day. 
And if you may remember, we may have some uh, some rainy days. Uh, so in this one, in this one, the uh, in the um, um, eight to eleven percent, ten to thirteen percent, you know. Um, this is probably where the uh, irrigation water was turned on. It was turned on, so, and then this is where it was turned off. And then slowly as the plant uses water, as the plant uses water, you know, it goes down to a certain level, and then irrigation was kicked back on, and then turned off, go down, 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 down. And sometimes you may see these, it could be small rain or something, it will uh, cause this kind of, you know, it may not go down to where the low, lower limit is, but it was, uh, you know, the sensor reading went back. And if you look at these two, uh, you know, this low level and this high level, by the way, I mean, it, what, what, what we say a uh, low level and high level, and really if you look at the, uh, the number here, it's not a whole lot of change. It's not a whole lot of difference. So if you look at these two uh, figure, uh, if you, you know, not pay close attention, you may not go, oh, these, you know, these two look almost exactly the same uh, when you look at these two graphs. But, you know, there are s slight changes here and there. And there is another reason. There is another reason I'm gonna show you later. Um, so this was the uh, this was the setting. Oh, this is is the setting. So this is the setting. Oh, so this is uh, the controller. This is where the controller is. And then you look at all these wires uh, are connected to these uh, the uh, wires connected to these um, the valves and to decide to turn on or turn off. And the wires. Uh, and the sensors are controlled by, by the sensors. Uh, these valves are controlled by the sensors, you know, based on the, the reading in the sensors. The sensor uh, sends the reading back to, the, to this uh, controller. So the controller process, processes the readings and then decide to turn on or turn off the, uh, the water. Uh, basically, this is uh, what it looks like. And these are the uh, two plants, the uh, two type of uh, plants that we used in this nursery, uh, magnolia and oak. Okay, remember, I only showed you one set of sensors. We actually have like three sets of sensors. Uh, we actually have three sets of, uh, sets of sensors uh, for each treatment. So, so this is a, uh, you know, sensor one, four, seven is the timer based. Uh, this one, we don't have any control because it's timer based. It's turned on, you know, whenever the, uh, uh, the nursery irrigation is turned on. And then two, four, two, five, eight is, you know, it, the irrigation is controlled as at eight to 11 uh, percent. Uh, the high moisture level uh, uh, is, um, being monitored by sensor three, six, and nine, it's at 10 to 13%. And if you look at this, you may say, oh, oh my goodness, this is like all over the place. So this is, this is one of the, uh, this is one of the difficulty, this is one of the difficulty that we're facing uh, using these uh, sensors in these containers. I'm gonna show you, this is the April, this is the April reading. This is the April reading. So what I showed you was, what I showed you at first was these, you know, sensors seven, eight, uh, nine. But actually we have three sensors. So basically the processor, the controller was taking average of all three sensors, of taking all three sensors. And she, if you look at these, it's like uh, totally it doesn't, you know, three and six doesn't, doesn't look like sensor nine at all. So, so what's the difficulty of using these sensors in these containers? Most of these sensors, most of these sensors uh, were developed for field use. Most of these sensors were developed for field use. 
So, you know, for fuel use with soil, um, and in soil conditions, and you know soils are even, even ve very sandy soil, you could still get a very close contact uh, between the sensors and uh, between the sensors and the soil and uh, basically the water in soil. When, it, when we use these sensors in containers, and you guys know how porous, how, you know, how loose the potting mix uh, is compared to soil. You know, um, um, if you remember buying, um, uh, in, in, in nurseries, a lot of them use uh, like a pine bark. And if you think about it, and the pine bark in the uh, size of um, probably uh, quarter, in the quarter, uh, quarter inch, uh, in a quarter inch uh, size, you know, somewhere below, <clears throat> around the quarter inch size. And, you know, if you think about the soil condition, <clears throat> most of the soil particles, most of the soil particles are much smaller, uh, much smaller than the quarter inch. So in the containers, it's really hard to have a very good contact to, to achieve that good contact between uh, between the sensors and the uh, and you know between the sensors and the and the particles, so uh, so so this is this is what we work with uh, you know. Um, but with that said, I think these uh, companies are getting better and better. So you know, so we look at these things, we look at these sensors, and we kind of know what kind of uh, things we should be looking at. You know, because when you water. When you water, you know, they're supposed to go up. When you stop watering, they're supposed to go down. And if they don't do a whole lot like this, uh, you know, it may not be the, uh, it may not be appropriate. And so, so, but, uh, but still we're uh, just working with the imperfection, uh, you know, uh, with what we have. So this is the, uh, the water use. Um, this is the uh, average water use this spring, January, February, March, and April. So remember, this was, uh, so, so basically, despite, you know, the inaccuracy of the, uh, uh, the inaccuracy of soil, of the, uh, the moisture sensors that we're dealing with, it's still, it's still working in a way that, you know, were not uh, water as much because each one of these spikes is a watering event, is a watering event. So if you compare, if you compare to the timer-based, you know, if you compare to the timer-based, uh, you know, we're uh, watering uh, here, you know, we may have one, two, three, four, five, six, but, you know, compared to the timer-based to the daily, you know, we're reducing the irrigation water in events a lot. Um, so that translate, so that translate to the water, uh, uh, significant water, water saving. And this is the average water usage in, in these four months. So this, this one is the timer based. Um, the green one represents the, uh, the low, the sensor based uh, low moisture level and the orange one is sensor-based high moisture level. And as you can see that <clears throat> there may be some difference between, you know, the sensor-based low moisture level and the high moisture level, but compared to the timer-based, compared to the timer-based, I mean, the sensor-based um, treatments are using so much less water, so much less water. And then you, May remember I mentioned at the beginning that uh, the 20 to 25 percent uh, water saving, uh, the 20 to 25 percent water saving, and then you look at these numbers, you might you might say, oh gosh, uh -huh, this is definitely a lot more than 20 to 25 percent water saving. So I do want you to keep in mind in these four months. What do we have in Texas? Rain, a lot of rain, 
a lot of rain. So this is this is um, this is a, a snapshot of the of the first four months. We can use this to represent the the whole year. You know, it definitely it does not represent the whole year. It only represents uh, January three through April because in these four months we have had a lot of rain. So in the timer based, you know, even a lot of times, even when it's still, uh, you know, it was it was it it had rain, but you know the 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 operator may uh, forget to turn off the irrigation and just kind of uh, let it run, uh, just simply forgot or too busy to get to uh, versus the timer based uh, versus the sensor based, you know, it's on its own. So, uh, so, you know, if, if it's wet, it's not going to turn on the irrigation. So that's why the water saves. So this is, this is very dramatic. But I wouldn't say this represents the whole year. But I mean, if you just look at these four months, the water saving is like tremendous. But of course, you know, in the nursery setting, uh, we do care more about how the plants are doing, you know, more so than the water that we have saved. <clears throat> so, so this is uh, this is looking at the the stem diameter and the plant height of these three treatments. Uh, so this one, the, the first one is um, the timer based. This is sensor, these two are sensor based, the sensor based low, uh, sensor based high, high range. So if you look at these, um, and this is for the magnolia, this is for the, the Schumard oak, and, and then we look at uh, plant height uh, for, um, you know, magnolia and Schumard oak. So you may notice, you may notice in this case, these two are sensor based. These two sensor based, the plants are, you know, have slightly, slightly uh, a bigger, uh, especially Schumard oak. If we just, let's focus on the Schumard oak. Slightly, slightly bigger stem diameter and slightly uh, a taller. For a magnolia, the uh, it's not significant. You know, statistically, it's not significant. And you may think, "Wow, why? You know, why uh, you're giving it less water? You irrigate with less water, but uh, the stem diameter is slightly bigger, and the plant height, you know, is taller. And there's no difference in magnolia. So I want to go back. I want to go back." I want to go back to this, uh, uh, to this, the sensor reading here. I'm, I'm just going to use this as an example. So oftentimes, in the timer based, in the timer based, um, in the timer based uh, irrigation uh, planning, you know, we we try we you know you may uh, the plants may be too dry. We don't want them too dry. We don't want them too wet, but if you have to err on one side, you know, we often err on the wet side uh, because we, you know, the, if they're on the wet side, the plants, uh, it's not going to die. But somehow if we err on the, uh, on the dry side, you know, the plants may, may, may die just because of, uh, you know, no water. So, you know, there is a chance. So, a lot of times, if you look at the timer based, some of the plants may be, um, may be in, um, a lot of times are in the wet, in the, in the wet regime, uh, you know, of, of that uh, moisture level. So it, in another way, um, I guess to put it another way is that, you know, they, it's just too wet for them. And the, the duration of this too wet period of time it may be too long for them in this timer based in this timer based irrigation versus compared to the sensor based so again you know this timer based is you know doesn't uh, consider the water need of these plants uh, versus these uh, sensor based it does uh, take the the plant water need you know the sensor the uh, you know how much water 
uh, how much moisture left in the uh, in the container it does consider you know take that into consideration so i think that's probably why that the shoe model and you know shoe model is doing better in the less water situation and the difference between magnolia and shoe model is probably magnolia uh does enjoy um you know compared to shoe model magnolia does enjoy uh slightly a uh, little bit more water or you know is tolerant is more tolerant of uh, longer duration of wetness and that could be the reason so uh, so so basically I mean the the preliminary result is pretty encouraging for right now um, you know look at the the water usage in these four months and then the uh, uh, you know the size of these two plants so in the different in a different uh, nursery setting, I mean we actually first you, this is this is a, a different uh, experiment in a different nursery. Uh, we actually used plants, you know, try to again we did we know that that uh, you know these sensors are um, you know mainly used in soil, and we. Uh, we try to, uh, you know, to to calibrate the sensors. Uh, we did a lot of calibration. Use petunia and just use these containers to make sure that all the emitters are, you know, uh, are emitting the same amount of water and all that kind of thing. So we try our best. We try our best to uh, to uh, you know to perfect the uh, the 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 situation. Again, these are the containers and, 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 and we have experienced some uh, irrigation system failure and stuff like that al along the way. Uh, uh, so this is the, uh, the here, the, we also did two type of uh, uh, plant materials. I think it's Indian hawthorn and the uh, ligustrum, wax leaf uh, ligustrum. So, um, so in this experiment, we have, um, you know, we set the irrigation, the irrigation will be turned on at below 15, at below uh, 18, or below 21. So this is, the 15 is the, uh, the driest, uh, and 21% is the uh, highest. Uh, this is the driest, uh, medium, and the wettest. I mean, not really wettest, but you know, among the three uh, treatments. So still, I mean, this is the 21% uh, in terms of uh, container media is by no means wet because uh, what the reason we want to do this is because we don't want the plants uh, to be in the soaking wet potting mix. That's something that we try to avoid. And so not only for saving water, but also for uh, plant health. Uh, so this is the uh, this is the uh, data uh, this is the data for uh, for these four treatments. Um, sorry about this. Uh, so this is timer based. The first column is timer based, uh, fifteen percent, eighteen percent, and twenty one percent. So this is timer based. Uh, you know, fifteen percent, eighteen percent, and twenty one percent. So as you can see that. Um, um, like the driest, like the driest, um, the canopy with uh, the driest, you may see that some of the data here, in, you know, uh, that it may be slightly uh, lower than the timer based. So in terms of growth index, uh, plant hide or uh, canopy width. But then if you look at the 18th percent and the, uh, the 20, the 21 percent, you know, they're basically either uh, about the same, you know, if compare or better than the timer based. All right, so uh, so that concludes uh, uh, my presentation on uh, sensor based uh, sensor based irrigation monitoring uh, monitoring and control system. So the the experiments are still going on and some of the water saving data that we're still uh, collecting. So hopefully in the future, uh, maybe a year from now, that I can you know, present to you a, a fuller picture 
of our uh, a full picture of our uh, experiment and see how much water that we may have saved, uh, you know, within uh, these two uh, nursery settings. So uh, with that, I'm going to move uh, uh, to our next speaker, Laura Miller. Laura, go ahead. Okay. Well, Meng Meng, I'm going to send you some data from Florida that I have uh, on uh, oaks. But anyway, um, today I'm going to get to talk about a plant of the week. And our plant this week is another great Texas superstar, Basham's Party Pink Crepe Myrtle. And I, I chose this because I knew Meng Meng would love to talk about a crepe myrtle. So, you know, we, we, we can all discuss this. Uh, this crepe myrtle is a Texas superstar, mostly because it has kind of a Texas origin story. So this crepe myrtle was introduced into the industry in 1965 by the legendary Lynn Lowry, who's really well known for his introduction of uh, Texas sage or ceniso into kind of mainstream nursery markets. But this is another plant he, he brought to us. Uh, it was bred by the man in the picture there, who is Bill Basham. He worked for the City of Houston Park Department. And back in the days when they were just kind of starting to cross Lagerstromia farii with the indicas, which we had been using for quite some time, um, he made this cross and selected it. and. It has some really nice features. In some ways, it will probably remind you of the very well-known Muskogee from the USDA breeding program because it's got the same kind of lavender pink flowers and very attractive bark. If you can see there, it's a really nice kind of light colored um, platy bark. And I think that, that the beautiful bark is one of the nicest features of these crepe myrtles, um, along with like notches and muskogee. That winter interest that you get from the bark is really, really, really lovely. The picture of the crepe myrtle was taken at the Fort Worth Botanic Garden last Wednesday. And it's uh, over in the perennial garden. For those of you who are in Fort Worth, they have uh, three of them there. You can kind of see one of them on the left edge of the photo. But this is a large crepe myrtle. It's a tall, large growing crepe myrtle, much like Muskogee and Natchez. You need some space for it. It will get big. It works well as a standard or as a multi-trunk. Like all crepe myrtles, it's quite easy to root from cuttings. They're all pretty, pretty nice for propagating and all great in full sun. Um, well-drained soils, the same, the same as all of our other crepe myrtles, they do really well in those conditions. But this one has a, a really special story. It's a beautiful crepe myrtle. It's a lovely addition to any landscape where you've got some space for a, for a flowering tree that will be blooming right now when it's so hot outside that you don't even want to, you know, go out there. You might want to look at it through the window. It is important to, we don't think of crepe myrtles as being pollinator plants and it doesn't have a little pollinator symbol in the Texas Superstar brochure, but it is an important plant for providing pollen to bees in August. Um, I went to a pollinator conference in Michigan of all places and there I met one of Dr. Juliana Ranhill's graduate students, Pierre Lau, and he had just completed a long study of pollen found in commercial beehives in Texas. And in the month of August, a significant percent of the pollen, and as you know, crepe myrtle has two different shapes of pollen, so they had a bit of a time getting it all identified, but a very large significant amount of the pollen that they found in beehives in August was from crepe myrtles in Texas. Because if you look around, there aren't a whole lot of things blooming and crepe myrtles do produce a lot of pollen. So. It is important as a pollinator plant, especially at this one little period of the year when there's not a lot of options for, for pollen. But it's a, a beautiful plant all year round, four seasons of, of really attractive bark, um, 
flowers in the very heat of the summer when you need them the most and and even a little bit of nice fall color so it's a it's a really beautiful tree and that's that thank you uh laura i i wish i could tell you all that uh, basham's party pink cray myrtle is um there's no cray myrtle bark scale at all you know this is uh, one of the resistant cultivars i wish <laughs> Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, I can't tell you that it's just as attractive to the criminal bark scale as it is <clears throat> to us humans. So, uh, yeah. Um, well, for whatever reason, this week when I was out, there was a lot of crepe myrtle bark scale on some other crepe myrtles in my rose trials, um, which I'm not even really sure which cultivars they are. But I didn't see any on these Basham Party pinks, and it may be that they're managing it pretty well at the Botanic Garden, but it looked great just last week. And I, and I can, uh, you know, about the, about the pollinators, <clears throat> I, I do a morning run like 6.30 to 7.30, and when I, uh, in my neighborhood, you know, there's a row of uh, Crate Myrtles. Crate Myrtles. I, I don't, I think it's more likely it's Muskogee. And definitely you're just amazed by 630, the buzz, you know, on those trees. Um, so, yeah. How do you have time to do a one hour morning run? And That's the only time I have in the day. That's <laughs> the only time. <laughs> I wish I could do it other time, but, uh, but that's the only time. You're my hero, Mung Mung. Oh, thank you. And by the way, uh, uh, Becky, you just missed all the nice word that I said about the new banner that you just oh. made. I just... <laughs> <sighs> all right, the well, time, the, the, the stage is yours. Well, um, so this is a photo that I have gotten within the past week, and I get several photos like this at this point in the year. And I'm actually going to encourage that all of our, we can have some discussion around this because, and I'm going to ask that Laura not comment because I know that she's probably already going to know what the problem is here. Mm -hmm. I am curious what some of our other panelists think. This was um, something I got from a home homeowner. They have, I mean, they just feel like something's wrong with their grass. They're curious, you know, what do I think is wrong with it? I already know the answer because I've already had a lot of correspondence with this person, but what do you guys think? Are we referring to the slight, like, kind of patching? There's, like, a little bit of patchiness in there? Yeah, there's, or... like, some patchiness in there. There's, like, a little bit of, like, chlorosis that we can see, some yellowing. She I mean, it looks like... pretty good to me compared to my lawn. That's whoa, not whoa, bad. Whoa, That's... Whoa. Irfan, by turf standards, <laughs> this looks like complete doo-doo. You know, we just, like, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. Are they over, I mean, are they over water? I mean, it looks like a lot of rain, and then they're probably watering as well. Yes. So... This time of year, most commonly when I get pictures of a turf problem, it is a water issue. Whether it is a broken ear piece of irrigation equipment, something that's not getting sufficient irrigation, or very commonly, it is over watering. And we get a lot of people that, you know, they're like, it's hot, it's dry, I need to water every single day. This particular homeowner was watering every single day when we did not receive rainfall. And so it does, it creates this kind of muck mess where it does look, it's a little hard to, I mean, I promise you if you got into it, you would be able to see it much more clearly because I'm guessing that these roots are very softened and shallow. And so, um, and she's got something digging in here too, which could certainly been, be an indicator that maybe there's some grub activity. I would be more inclined to think that there's just other things living there that are being kind of brought up to the surface by all the moisture. Um, and so, cause I'm not seeing really other signs of grubs doesn't mean that they're not there, but, um, yeah, so very commonly we see a lot of people overwater their yard this time of year. And so I always try to make it a priority to remind all of our viewers here today, um, that we do not recommend that you water your yard every day, even during the hottest parts of the year. You know, our, our whole motto is deepen and frequent. This is what encourages deeper root development in plants. We have to torture them a little bit. And this is different from nursery production, right? So Mumlin was talking about nursery production. We're talking about in a landscape setting with our turf grass areas, we want to water deeply and then we want to allow enough time between waterings that the upper part of that profile begins to dry out because it kind of 
motiv motivates our roots, for lack of a better term, to reach for those water resources deeper in the soil. If we go out and we water every day, we create codependent turf babies that have very shallow root systems. This also creates conditions that can promote disease. So very commonly, I will see, especially as we move into the fall, you know, then I'll see, well, it looks like disease and people just start dumping fungicides on it instead of addressing the core issue, which is a water issue. And so, you know, if you're seeing stuff in your turf this time of year, check your irrigation system, double check your programming, turn your water off once we get to winter. Laura can attest to the fact that people will leave their water on in Fort Worth throughout the winter for like two days a week. This is not necessary and not it's gonna create turf problems, so. I think Mung Mung's talk though actually showed that you can overwater in a nursery, even though you've got that small little soil yeah. volume. It, those plants were probably getting more water than they needed. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, by the way, we did not plan on this, but it just happened that I'm talking water and, and Becky Yell is also talking water. Talking and water. this is yeah. so true. Uh, I mean, even in the nursery situation that, uh, um, and as you can see, some of my treatments that, you know, the water interval is much longer than the daily watering that the timer-based uh, irrigation uh, regime. Yeah. And 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 in this, well, the in the containers is definitely different from the uh, from the soil, but but the water dynamic is very similar. The water table kind of goes down, so you know, so it goes down. So if at the bottom, you know, before they kind of get completely out, and I mean, not you, you're never gonna get it completely depleted the water moisture, but if you just you know, uh, if you if you don't let it go down enough, you're basically, you're, you're, you're drowning your water uh, slightly in a way. So uh, I think that's, that's, that's how that we have seen that by using, uh, using less water, water uh, less frequently in the nursery setting. But of course, you know, in the nursery setting, you gotta, you gotta have sensors. You gotta have sensors to say, oh, well, uh, they're, they're they're thirsty now you know yeah. they're thirsty now yeah they're thirsty now turn it on um and and so not only saving water but really uh uh just not drowning the plants in a way so i think yeah. it's similar to the landscape situation here it's definitely yeah, similar absolutely. to the landscape yeah i think it's more challenging to do this in a nursery environment for me than yeah because it's just more of a balancing act but yeah i would say like you know, and Laura's got years of experience as a county agent as well. You know, I would say like eight times out of 10 that I have an issue with the lawn, it's a function of too much love, not too little love. Uh, it's people that over fertilize or over apply pesticides or over, you know, over water. And, and uh, I like St. Augustine as a grass, but I would say it's even less forgiving of some of that excessive love than some of our other species. And so, yeah, like gray leaf spots, a good example of that. Yeah. Too much fertilizer, too much water, and you're going to, you know, flare that up sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and anyways, yeah. And I was going to comment that I see over here, way in the corner, I see a visitor to our chat that isn't normally there. Um, Who is that? Hi, Raymond. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. He got on his communication uh, meeting finished up and he, uh, he, I sent him the link and he got on. Yes. Thank hey. you, Raymond, for uh, joining us. Hey, guys. Yeah, I saw a, uh, I'm at the beach, so. Beautiful. So, uh, I, I have a picture I should send y'all, but it was of some moms uh, and, uh, we were walking by through a greenhouse at, at, up north, these mums, and I'm going, well, what's wrong with this bay of mums here? And, and the guy goes, well, tell me. You tell me what's wrong. And uh, I get to looking, and all the rest of the bays had drip lines in them. They were hand-watering that section of mums, and they were hand-watering them every day, but they could not hand water them uniformly enough to get a uniform growth of those mums. Uh, and so it looked dramatically different. Same planting date, same varieties, all that, just ununiform watering was giving them an ununiform crop. Yeah. 
It's, it's funny you mentioned because, I mean, yesterday I was just visiting a facility that had, you know, mums and they had several bays that looked very poor, several bays that looked great. The ones that looked poor in this case were on drip. And I think it's because they went through just a few too many dry cycles and that drip was, and these are large, these are like 14 inch pots. So that water was just probably going just straight through. I mean, the, the, the root, the root ball just was not there. Whereas the ones that were hand watered, I mean, they were getting that water kind of all over. And so I guess it's kind of interesting how you can have like, you know, uh, different results using the same technique, you know, or like opposite results, just depending on how it's, how it's done. Well, and if you ever let uh, potting soil get dry, as you know, it can become hydrophobic. Uh, <laughs> And, well, that, uh, that's a main issue with the uh, with the peat moss based. Uh, that's a main issue with the peat moss based um, uh, potting mix. Uh, if it's uh, cocoa uh, core based, it has less of the uh, hydrophobic issue. Um, but you'll see it even in native soil sometimes. Those super yes, dry yeah. soils when they first the first water that hits them is beaten up and running off and not going in. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting, um, that aspect. We, I was at Shamley Roses before they no longer existed. And one day and we were walking through the nursery and I said, uh, Mark, one thing I'm gonna tell you is this, this section here needs some water seriously. He said, we just watered it. I said, they are not, they're, the root ball is dry the water's not getting into this. You're going to have to come through and soak these. And it, he, he looked at it and he was just like, oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, so you've got to watch that aspect of it. So if they ever get dry, they'll probably have to go through there and soak it. And that's probably what happened with those is they let them, they mm -hmm. had that dry cycle and then they never got it wet again. We'll see it with our yard containers too. Uh, have to water them several times to get them to thoroughly wet if we've let them get dry. Yeah. Kevin and Carlos, do you guys have any uh, input on these? I, I use in my lawn, I use water as a plant growth regulator. <laughs> because I don't want to mow that. Don't mow this weekend. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so you're that. using, so you're using not watering as the uh, plant growth deregulator. Yeah. This, this year, I'm, I'm, uh, my, the rain is messing me up. <laughs> Dear it. Especially the, 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 the high quality water we have in College Station. I'd rather not <laughs> with that water. Uh, by the way, if you guys didn't get that, uh, the quality of the water in College Station is unique. That's a good way to put it. No, no. It, I, I've tried to kill my yard before. Oh. I've seen Augustine yard. I've been trying to get Bermuda grass to take over. Um, unfortunately, I have not been very successful over the last eight, nine years. Uh, partly because I guess I'm the lowest house area. And uh, even though I don't turn on my watering system only once a week, very minimal just to maintain it somewhat brown. Um, we get a lot of water coming down from uh, irrigation uh, sprinklers that, that uh, run a little bit too long and sometime not cor correctly calibrated. So um, landscapers out there, that's one thing that you can uh, advise your, your customers or, or if you do provide that service, you know, encourage them to, to do regular checking of the spray areas uh, to ensure that that uh, there's uh, conservation of water. When I, in Valentine's Day this past year, uh, somebody had run their irrigation overnight here in Dallas and it led to a five car wreck on a semi-major road because all that water had run into the street and then we had a 28 degree night and it froze over and there was an ice patch there people didn't expect and it caused an accident. So there's all kinds of issues that can happen if we're not watering properly so or dewatering properly <laughs> yeah yeah i uh... uh 
Well, okay. Uh, Erfan, do you guys want to, uh, I mean, at the very beginning, the three of us, the four of us were talking about the bug, the, the moth or something. Uh, do you want to, what, what, what give, was give it? Give a preview or, or talk about it? or maybe, uh, No, maybe, maybe just a preview. Maybe we will talk about it in the future uh, chats. Yeah, so I think it's a um, it's an annual issue and is is has uh, apparently been particularly problematic on mums, although it is relatively broad spectrum, so it, it has a relatively broad host range, I should say. So it gets on a number of different plants, including say poinsettias. Um, it's known as the Duponcellia moth or European pepper moth, and uh, this thing the, the the moth is nocturnal so it's a night flyer very small about the size of a penny or smaller in diameter and they lay eggs near the base of the plant those larvae will feed near the base of the plant near the soil line so very hard to see they they're very good at hiding and they chew on that that uh, base uh, of that stem kind of like girdling it and it can cause uh, dieback of entire portions of the plant so it would be, uh, so I think it might be beneficial to, to discuss it perhaps next week, a little bit more about this pest and learn about how many of you, because I'm just learning now that there's been um, at least a few growers that have been experiencing major economic loss to this particular pest. So it'd be beneficial to know how widespread is this problem, uh, how regular is it, and to determine whether we need to investigate some better management strategies uh, for this particular pest in, in Texas. So yeah. I don't know, I might, might do like a little 10 minute, 10, 15 minute review of this particular pest. Uh, I don't know, next week, if we have time, I, I can't remember what we have scheduled. Well, next time, next week is our third Thursday. Our chat. So oh yeah. That's our, our chat. that's our chat. That's our chitty chat. chat. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. chat. So, okay, okay, okay. so yeah. So next Wednesday, well, not next Wednesday. So, so, so for you all in the audience, you know, send us questions and everything. Well, you know, we're not going to have a uh, 20, 30 minute uh, special topic like, like what we did today. Uh, but it's small, you know, answering uh, questions from the audience and, and stuff like that. So uh, either post your questions at our, uh, uh, chat with Green Aggie's uh, Facebook page or email me, email any of our, uh, you know, panelists that you feel uh, comfort, you know, you feel comfortable with. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so that's where, um, that's, uh, that's what the third, third Thursday will be our chitty chat Thursday. So, yeah. Yeah. And so by the I way, this I can is... either, I don't know if, I mean, I don't know. I might, might talk about, I mean, cause I've had photos submitted. So, you know, okay, you have photos, photos submitted. Discuss, <laughs> but related to it. And then I don't know, maybe another Thursday, go a little more detail on it, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I've, I've been also dabbling in moths lately. Um, I'm sorry. I've been dabbling in moths lately too. Uh, a turf moth, the fall armyworm. I've got uh, some traps out, you know, agents trap for fall armyworm in, in hay fields every year. And I asked Dr. Swiger if I could have some traps and just uh, trap in turf. And she said, sure. And so I've got one at a, at a golf course and one at a sports field. And I started catching moths two weeks ago. Had yeah. more moths, have larvae. Those are pher pheromone traps? Yep, yeah, pheromone traps, yep. Yeah. We've been seeing the larvae already. Uh, yeah, been, I, I, yeah, larvae three weeks ago, actually. They've been active a lot throughout the summer at times that I was like, was what are you doing out? Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> and then we, uh, they had them out at the new PGA course this past week that they spotted them on the new yummy sprigs and sod that they just planted uh, there. So, so great. That's